Thank you, Federica, for the wonderful introduction. Thank you to Betsy and Todd for the uh, invitation today. Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. I tend to be a little quiet, so holler if you can't hear from the back, please. Let's get, let's get started, y'all. Um, it's especially lovely to be here at Princeton, given that the book came out with Princeton Press right across the way. Um, and I'm honored to be here and appreciate the gift of your time out of your very busy week to be here and to hear about my book. I'm very pleased to share with you a bit about this that came out, as Federica mentioned, in February with Princeton Press. So let's dive in and get to these stories. Most analysts tend to agree that the United States public policy is more hostile toward families than any other country in the Western industrialized world. It has the least generous benefits, the lowest public commitment to caregiving, one of the highest gender wage gaps between employed men and women, and one of the highest maternal and child poverty rates of any Western industrialized nation. It is no exaggeration, I argue in the book, to say that women's work family conflict in the US is a national crisis. Roughly 70% of mothers work outside of the home today, and most of them do so full time. Yet, women still complete the lion's share of childcare and housework. I'd like each of you just for a moment in your own heads to imagine for yourself if you can think of a woman, a working mother, uh, who would describe herself as someone who is overwhelmed by stress. <laughs> as someone who is maybe a friend or a loved one, a relative, or even yourself. Someone that feels exhausted, harried, overwhelmed and pushed to their limits on a daily basis. So just think about that in your head for a moment and by a show of hands, please, would you let me know if that's something that resonates with you or someone in your life? Raise them high. Okay, so virtually every single hand in the entire room is up. This is a small N, right? But we know that this is a crisis that transcends region, it transcends religion, um, it transcends race and class. And I argue again that I think this is a national crisis. And among sociologists, there's a general consensus that US social policy is failing American women and their families. And many of these scholars suggest that we look to Europe for alternative models of how we can better support uh, women in both their work and their family lives. So that's what I did in this book as the result. From 2011 to 2015, I interviewed 135 middle-class working mothers in Germany, Sweden, Italy, and the United States. And the intention here in the study was to understand what everyday life is like for women as they navigate motherhood and employment in places with very different social policies and very different cultural attitudes as it relates to men and women and work and family. This is the first study, I think, to, uh, to understand work family policies cross nationally from the perspective of mothers themselves. Um, and I would argue that it's incredibly important that we turn to the women impacted by these policies in order to understand how they play out in the daily lives, uh, again, of those most impacted by them. I wanna talk to you briefly about uh, the, the three bodies of literature that frame my study. Uh, the first is this research coming out of mostly feminist welfare state theory about the gender nature of contemporary governance today. And these theories draw on Foucauldian notions of governmentality to think through what it means for states to produce governable citizens. Citizens um, are shaped by the various work family policies uh, in each of these countries and the ways that they distribute both responsibilities but also entitlements and protections to men and women. They are gendered subjects, right? And by implementing different work family policies, these states both reflect and also reinforce gender ideologies that are bound up in a state's specific history and culture. These, these various uh, decisions are indicative of what we call a state's gender regime, these normative beliefs about both masculinity and femininity that reflect what we think of as right and proper for men and women and when it comes to paid work and unpaid caregiving. And in this way, I argue in the book that work family policies uh, shape the way that men and women act and are expected to act, teaching citizens to govern themselves. And of course, as, as prim primarily middle-class white women, my respondents do not, of course, represent the lived experiences or perceptions of all women in these various countries. But I argue that they serve as canaries in a coal mine. And in some ways, they serve as a conservative test for women's work family conflict, um, primarily because they have more advantages and resources available than those who are less advantaged. And so in many ways, the stories I'm going to share with you today represent a best case scenario for working mothers. 
Secondly, and relevant to many people in this room, uh, I, the past decade or so has seen a surge in cross-national uh, quantitative research, demographic research, about how work family policies operate cross-nationally as countries strive to improve their fertility rates and women's labor force participation rates. And these international comparisons have been vital in giving us a really good understanding of the structure of these policies as well as the outcomes of these policies. But I would argue that because this research is largely survey or census based, it lacks the voices of working mothers themselves. And we need to understand the intervening processes that play out in the daily lives of working mothers in order to have an understanding of how these policies translate on the ground in people's everyday lives. And finally, a very rich body of work here in the States has focused on the competing devotions that women today feel between work and family. Um, scholars have exposed, for example, the forced choices that here uh, in the States women tend to feel compelled to make when it comes to managing employment and motherhood. And, and these studies have focused centrally on women's voices, but they are specific to the United States. And of course, interview research with employed moms has been conducted around the world and suggests that it is no walk in the park anywhere to be an employed mom. But uh, again, most of this research is siloed within countries. And I argue that we need to compare and contrast women's experiences across national borders. For this reason, I think that comparing them across national borders allows us to examine both whether and how cultural schemas of the ideal worker and what it means to be a good mother vary in very different policy landscapes. I show how the work family conflict that is described in the US literature is mitigated or not in other countries that have, again, very different public policies and different cultural understandings for employment and for parenting. I'm going to touch briefly on my methods, and I'm very happy to return to this in the Q&A if you have more specific questions. Um, but as I mentioned, I conducted 135 interviews with working mothers across the four countries. And I focus specifically on mothers because in all industrialized nations, they have historically been the targets for work family policies. They also tend to continue to be responsible for most child care and housework, as I mentioned. <coughs> They also report greater work-family conflict than men do, and they also use work-family policies more often than men do. <coughs> and my cases of study are four countries that are very commonly used to exemplify the Western welfare approaches. Um, and I conducted field work, as I mentioned, in, in six stages from 2011 to 2015. And um, I conducted interviews in both East Germany and Western Germany to facilitate a comparison in this country that has a very interesting and rich sociopolitical history, especially as it relates to maternal employment. And during each stage of fieldwork, I was very fortunate to serve as a visiting researcher at a variety of research institutes and universities in each place. And um, for grad students in the room, I'm very happy to chat with you more should this be of interest about how to find and secure these positions, but I think they were elemental to my success in this this particular project. And I have the good fortune of continuing collaborations with my colleagues at these various institutes um, ongoing today, which is really wonderful. Um, and again, as sort of an outsider within conducting research in these places, partnering with local native born collaborators, I think is really vital. So happy to chat more about that if that's of interest to you. And for comparison purposes, as I mentioned, I interviewed women at the middle of the social class structure across these various field sites. And I conducted all these interviews myself making this the first study on this topic to involve a single researcher across multiple country sites. And this approach necessitated conducting interviews in English, which was suitable for conversations with middle class women in these European cities. Uh, and again, I'm happy to chat more about my methods, um, the limitations of these methods, as well as the sample's demographic characteristics in the Q&A, if that's of interest. But I will say that my sample includes a wide range of occupations, of family structures, and also of working hours for working moms. All of the women that I interviewed were either employed or on maternity leave at the time of our conversation, and they had one or more children living in the home currently with them. And it was most common for women to work part-time in Germany. Women tended to report working overtime hours the most in Italy and the United States, which perhaps does not surprise anyone in this room. Most of these interviewees were also highly educated and white. I was able to recruit a greater proportion of racial and ethnic minority women in the American field site in Washington, DC, because um, recruiting was much smaller a barrier, as you could imagine, and language didn't pose the same barrier that it did in these other countries. I interviewed these women in their homes and in their offices. 
also in neighborhood parks and playgrounds or sometimes at after work bars over a glass of wine together. Um, I spent a lot of time with these women. I, I spent time with their children. I spent time with their partners. Uh, when I went to their offices, I got to meet their colleagues, their bosses, their friends in the workplace. Um, and when I was in women's home, I spent a lot of time doing things like stirring a pot of pasta on the stove while they rushed a child to bed, um, washing soap out of a child's hair so they could get the other one's dinner prepared, right? Um, again, drinking wine at after work bars was a common theme in some of these places with women. Um, and the emotional tenor and the intensity of these interviews really varied across the country sites. Part of, I think, the, the power of qualitative research is to draw on the emotive differences in the experiences of the women in each of these places. And these came through in my interviews. The, the emotional tenor and the intensity really, really varied. So in Sweden, for example, women tended to be quite calm and reflective during our conversations, getting a bit more animated as they started talking to me about what they still wanted to see improved in the country's work family policies. By contrast, in a place here like the US, when I conducted interviews with moms in DC, they seemed so exhausted. <laughs> Women uh, very often rubbed their temples while we talked, they cast their eyes down, their brows furrowed, their shoulders hunched. Um, and women in all of these field sites, with the exception of Sweden, sometimes cried during our interviews. And they often cried, uh, most often in the US, but very regularly in response to one question that I hadn't anticipated this response to prior to me asking it. Uh, and the question that I asked that tended to elicit the most tears from respondents was, I know that everybody has their own idea of what it means to be a good parent to your children. But to you, how would you define being a good mother? And the fact that this elicited a great deal of tears from my respondents to me suggests something very powerful about the influence of not only culture, but also policy in the daily lived experience. It gets to some of our most intimate understandings of what it means to be a person or a woman or a worker or a citizen or a parent or a partner. And to me, work family policy is not just an, an object of academic inquiry. When, whether, when women explain to me in tears that they felt that they were failing their children, this to me suggests that there's something quite radical that needs to be done in reforming our system of welfare provisioning so that an entire generation of women does not feel they are failing their kids. In the interest of time today, I, I want to share with you a vignette uh, from one woman in each of these places. And I use each of these vignettes to open each chapter of the book. And these accounts typify the experiences of the mothers that I interviewed in each field site. And I'm going to mirror the order of the book's chapters. I can arrange on a spectrum um, women who felt the most satisfied and the least conflicted about their work and family lives to those who felt the most stressed and the most conflicted about work and family. And uh, does anyone want to take just a guess at where we might start our interviews, given my field sites? Indeed, we're going to start in Sweden, uh, and then we're going to move kind of more depressingly, more sadly, sociologists are really good at studying this sad stuff, to the place where women experience the most exhaustion, stress, overwhelm that I mentioned, which is here in the good old US of A. Exactly right. Um, so first travel with me to Stockholm, and I want to introduce you to uh, a woman named Josephine. And Josephine was a marketing manager, and she worked 40 hours a week. She and her husband, Marcus, have a three-year-old and a two-month-old. And we met at a busy cafe while her older daughter was at public childcare. We met um, at a place where there were other families surrounding us, both men and women pushing strollers around. And uh, she brought her infant son to our meeting and described the fact that she was on a 10 month paid parental leave when we met. She had taken a similar length leave with her, her older child and she described that her husband Marcus, who's a consultant, took eight months of paid parental leave with their first child and was planning to do the same after she returned to work. I asked Josephine whether any Swedish policies or benefits could be changed in order to better support herself or her family. And Josephine thought for a second and said, I really think we have really a great system. I think in general, it's very much accepted. It's in the culture that, you know, you need to either have flexible hours or you have to work reduced time for a couple of years when the kids are young. And that's in the policies as well, that you have the right to do that. So I think, no, I think that we're pretty good. As an American, this shocked me, as you could imagine. Um, so I asked Josephine to describe to me some of these work family policies. 
For example, she enjoyed 30 days of paid vacation a year. For her three-year-old, she paid roughly $80 a month for full-time childcare. <laughs> we'll let that one sink in and you can tell how many parents are in the room here, generally speaking. So, so yeah, this is less than $2,000 a year for daycare. Here in the US, estimates suggest that uh, for a kid zero to four in a public or in a private daycare facility, um, Parents pay $9,589 a year here in the States. That is a drastic underestimate. When I talk to women, I tend to say that it's two to three times that high for one children and even more for multiple children. So $80 a month for full-time childcare. After returning from leave, Josephine will also work 30 hours a week, which is a legal right for all parents until their children are eight years old. And I asked Josephine whether she thought it was possible to be both a successful worker and a successful mother at the same time. She looked at me like this was a bit of a silly question and answered without hesitation, yes, yeah, absolutely. Our whole system and all of our policies are based on the thought that you're supposed to be able to work as a woman if you have a family. I see a lot of people who have been able to manage a family and a career. And Josephine and the other Swedish moms that I interviewed actually laughed in our conversations when I used this phrase, working mother. They'd say something like this, I don't think that expression working mother actually exists in Swedish. And you could tell she was struggling to find her words. It's, I mean, you can't be anything else. It's not like they're sort of a non-working mother. Of course she's working. I mean, what else would she do? And again, this elicited laughter. And there, indeed, there is no Swedish equivalent to the phrase working mother. She says something powerful about how our language captures our lived experience. Um, so, of course, the question is, what policies enabled this high degree of satisfaction for women like Josephine? Sweden is a classic model of a social democratic welfare state, and it has a long history of intertwining family policy with gender equality and labor policy. Their work family policy is rooted in a dual earner carer model that gives the same rights and obligations regarding work and family to both men and to women and their policies actively promote equality between citizens. They frame family support and the task of child rearing not as private issues, but as collective, uh, as collective responsibilities. And the Swedish government has said quite um, explicitly in the media that they declare themselves a feminist government. So central to being a good mother for Josephine and all of my partnered Swedish respondents was having an egalitarian household and division of labor which echoed both the cultural expectation but also the policy endorsement of gender equality. And these policies, or excuse me, these attitudes very deeply shaped the ways that women like Josephine went about using benefits like parental leave. Josephine told me she felt comfortable returning to work after her leave knowing that her partner was going to be home for eight months after, her child, after she went back to work. And when she learned she was pregnant, her partner said, well, we'll split it evenly, referring to the parental leave right off the bat. And I began to ask Josephine whether she had ever discussed with her partner the prospect of her taking you know, most of the leave and him taking just a bit or none at all. And she interrupted me and said, no, no, I haven't had to push him to take any of it, um, to take any of his part of it. And that phrasing to me is really powerful. Uh, women like Josephine did not talk about men's duty or obligation or responsibility to their families. Instead, they talked about men's right to time with their children. And this discourse of rights is embedded in Sweden's welfare law, that parents have a right to equal access to time with their children, and that conversely, children also have a right to equal access to time with their parents. And although women in Sweden were the happiest in my sample, this didn't mean that it was this gender equality nirvana that we sometimes think about from the US perspective. Josephine told me that sometimes she felt pressured to excel as a mother in ways that felt problematic. So she told me, she suggested to new moms, Lower the ambition. You can't have a full-time job, a perfect home, do your workout three days a week. These years of my life, it's going to be work and family. So I don't have a lot of time for friends or for me, but that's fine. I can pick that up later on. And my home isn't perfectly clean, but that's okay too. So a lot of conversation about letting your home go is like kind of the first thing to, to, to fall off women's plates. Um, women in Stockholm sort of described to me feeling a, a quiet but steady pressure to perform a, a gender neutral version of Sharon Hayes intensive mothering, sort of an intensive parenting that was rooted in class privilege. They described feeling pressured to make home cooked meals, to enroll their kids in the best daycare pos possible, to not leave their kids too long in these daycare facilities, and to make sure that they spent plenty of time outdoors. So when women there did feel conflict, they tended to point to these intensive parenting ideals as the source of their stress. 
And I asked uh, Josephine what could be improved in the policies, and she said she was really frustrated the government only pays 80% of wages during parental leave. She was furious about this and said, when we're on a parental leave, we're getting 80%. So that's a really, really big dip when it comes to income. So women took this gender equality mandate very seriously, right? Overall, overall, Josephine felt well supported by these gender egalitarian work family policies, and she felt that the government supported her in her dual roles, and she, in fact, felt entitled to this support. I want to travel now with you all south of the Baltic, uh, across the water, and into northeastern Germany and into uh, Berlin, which brings us to the door of Dorothea's flat. Um, so come with me here, transition our brains to the German context now. And she greeted me at her door with her nine-month-old daughter on her hip. Her three-year-old was also at daycare. And uh, she waved me across the hall and we, we sat down in her little kitchen and she had displayed a, a plate of pears for us to eat and she breastfed on and off throughout, throughout our interview together. And um, Dora was born in socialist East Berlin. And she told me that mothers like hers worked full time. She said, it was normal to see that my mom was working and not a stay at home mom. I went to childcare really early when I was six or eight weeks old. So although East and West Germany shared both a language and a cultural background, during the 40 years that East Germany or the GDR operated as an independent country after World War II, it had its own radically different economic and political systems, as I mentioned, especially regarding women's work. The GDR's constitution guaranteed both the right and the duty to employment, so women and men worked full time while men, women maintained primary responsibility for the home. Meanwhile, in West Germany, many of their policies sought to preserve a male breadwinner, female caregiver model. These included things like marginal income taxation, very lengthy and rigid parental leave that was virtually maternity leave. They had short school days and very few public daycare facilities for children under the age of three. And their public health care and pension systems also automatically granted insurance rights to economically inactive wives with economically active husbands. So Dora was seven years old when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. And afterward, West German institutions and policies were transferred to the East, including support for this male breadwinner model. Mothers were suddenly discouraged from working outside the home, especially when their kids were young, which is the exact opposite message that they had received under the GDR. So Dora was 33 when I interviewed her, and uh, she mentioned to me when she uh, showed me out the door that she lived a few blocks from some former Stasi offices, and she works 23 hours a week at a high school teaching German and English. She loves her job. She's never worked full-time and never plans to. And she was on leave, as I mentioned, for about a year with each of her children, and her husband took roughly three to four months leave each time. And in reunified Germany, parents have long been able to take up to three years of paid leave. And Dora reflected to me, I thought one year is okay. I can take care of her basic needs and then I go off to work. I don't wanna stay home for three years. And I think going to daycare early is better for the kids. They totally benefit, which is again, a legacy of the GDR. Dora mentioned how easy it was to find daycare facilities that were still left from the GDR era, even 25 years later. And in light of the region's tumultuous history regarding women's roles in public life and in family life, I asked Dora whether she had any guilt about returning to work when her kids were young. And she said, I'm not guilty that I work. I think it's important to be a role model. For me, demonstrating another world that a woman has is important. I want to imprint that on my daughters. I think it's common for women in my environment to start working again, maybe after one or two years. Stay-at-home moms aren't around that much in Berlin, but I wouldn't judge them, she was careful to say. I couldn't do that personally, but it doesn't mean that other people can't. She also felt really strongly at the same time about gender equality. She told me that both parents have an equally big role in raising children. I see a lot of fathers in my environment and they are doing the same equal parenting style as we do. But toward the end of our conversation, Dora reflected quietly to me on the pressure that she felt as a mom in Germany. She said, I think the demand society has for moms, they are like, mom has to do everything perfectly. When the kids are not well behaved, it's the mom's fault. I try to distance myself from that, to reflect on the things that society wants from a mom. You have to be perfect in any direction. Perfect homemaker, look great, bake home, bake, bake home baked cookies to bring to the kindergarten. And she said, she kind of wrung out her hands and said, no, I'm, I'm working, I can't bake a cake. And there's this like thread of baking in school that 
I find very interesting uh, for anyone who's a sociologist of food. There's something about intensive mothering ideology and cooking for your kids at their school that is very time intensive for moms that they really don't like for the record. So putting that out there is future research. Um, and I want to cross uh, this inner Deutsche Klanse into the, the inner German border into Western Germany to introduce you to Doro's counterpart, who I call Sonia in the book. And um, I met Sonia outside of her office on a beautiful sunny day, um, and we talked over coffee. It was central to the German workday, taking a break for afternoon coffee and cake. Um, and we talked at a picnic table on a really lovely afternoon. And Sonia is a journalist. Uh, she has an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old. Um, she has a PhD, and she works 20 hours a week, which is unusual here for anyone with a PhD to work <laughs> such low hours. Um, her husband, Nico, also has a doctorate, but Nico works full time. And Sonia grew up in Western Germany. And as was typical, her mom stayed at home while her dad worked. But then her parents got a divorce, and her mom had no choice but to find work outside the home. She ended up finding a job as a secretary, and Sonia described to me, she didn't want to work. She had to work to earn money. I was the only child with a working mother, so she had bad feelings. She always thought she's a bad mother. In German, there exists the word Rammutter, like the mother of a raven. I think it doesn't exist in English. <laughs> I said, no, it doesn't. Could you describe this to me? And uh, she, she said yes and uh, described what a raven mother was in the opinion of, of German. So raven mother's the translation, right? A very bad mother like the ravens. They fly away from the nest and they don't care for their children. She felt like a Kabmuta. I learned from my mother that I have to stay at home. It's better for the children. The man has to work and the woman has to do the household and take care of the children. But watching her own mother, Sonia recognized the value of working outside the home when her children were young. However, this spurred a great deal of guilt and tension for her between her work and family lives. She felt pressured to leave her job and to devote herself entirely to her children when they were young. But after earning her PhD, Sonia decided to return to work before the three years of parental leave was up. And she tried to find a daycare facility that would take her kids for longer part-time hours. Uh, however, she faced two problems. The first was at the time that, German, that the German government only guaranteed spots for kids in daycare ages three and older, right? And her son was two years, three months at the time. And the second difficulty was that even if she could find a place to admit her younger one, the longest hours she found was 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. So she, can, she decided to take a spot where that was the schedule, and she continued to work part-time in a job she was overqualified for, which allowed her to care for her children in the afternoons while her husband continued to work full-time. She told me that her family actually would have netted more money had she stayed at home for the full three years of leave and instead... Yeah, stayed home, not worked outside the home um, at all, and her family would have earned more money in that scenario than if she worked for pay outside the home at this time, which is effectively an incentive for women to stay in the home, right? And unlike the women that I interviewed in East Germany, which today maintains a strong legacy of near full female employment, Western German mothers did not perceive support for dual career households. Sonia and other mothers told me that they were called raven mothers to their faces. And sometimes uh, women reported to me even being called career horse, uh, often by stay-at-home mothers or, or folks of older generations. Sonia told me that she rejected this label of raven mother, and she told me that working outside the home made her a better mother. But her defensiveness and the emotional distress that she showed during our interview, to me, suggested that she had internalized this conservative welfare state discourse that good mothers stay home when they have young children, which spurred substantial guilt and frustration. Sonia and the other mothers I interviewed in Western Germany bristled against these strongly held cultural norms that privileged male breadwinner families and stigmatized working mothers. But at the same time, I saw these disparities reproduced in Sonia's own life. I asked Sonia, for example, how she divided up house household tasks and responsibilities with her husband, Nico, and she told me with a frown, oh, it's very traditional because my husband has a full-time job and is working a lot. I'm working 50% and I care for the kids in the afternoons. I do the cooking and everything. It's very traditional at the moment. It's not really good. But he earns the money. I didn't find a job in which I could earn the same. So it's a financial decision. <laughs> 
I hear people gasping in the audience up here, which I agree sounds a little frustrating. Um, so in the past decade or two, with the goals of increasing both fertility and women's labor force participation, especially amongst mothers, the German government has initiated a major shift in their social policies, and it, look much, it looks today much more like social democratic policies that we'd, we would see in a place like Sweden. So for example, they shortened parental leave to one year, they added these use it or lose it daddy months of leave to try to incentivize men to take more time at home. And they're very quickly trying to increase childcare spaces for kids younger than age three. The Western German mothers that I interviewed acknowledged that they were living in a dramatically shifting sociopolitical context, which Sonia said to me. Now times are changing. The last five years, there's a lot of new programs. So the daycare facilities take kids up to two years old. They have more hours between six or seven hours per day. Now it's getting better because now more women are working, and it's a process. I wanna ask you all to fly south with me, somewhere a little warmer, somewhere in my mind with much better food, to Rome, uh, and I wanna introduce you to Elena. Uh, Elena welcomed me into her flat. Uh, she lived in an upscale neighborhood near Vatican City, and um, I came to her house at about 8.45, and she had just gotten back from work. Her husband, Francesco, was out of town, and, um, Elena was hurrying to make a plate of pasta in the kitchen, um, and her daughter was in the bathtub. We chatted uh, while she rushed her kid out of the bathtub into pajamas so we could sit and talk and she could shovel pasta into her mouth, and we could drink wine from the region that she uh, grew up in, that she was very proud to give me this. My book editor said I should leave out the wine drinking part, so I did, but you all get the insider scoop that indeed, <laughs> wine sometimes goes hand in hand with these interviews. Um, and we sat on the edge of her daughter's bed while her daughter watched TV and ate her pasta. Um, and I described Elena in the book as, as being like a faucet that once it was turned on, I couldn't get her to stop talking <laughs> about her experiences. Um, she worked about 50 hours a week as a marketing manager, and she described her job to me as a golden prison. She had a good salary, she felt well respected, but her work, she thought, required extreme commitment. She said, they really push you to have the best from you. She believed that she was denied a promotion after announcing her pregnancy in the workplace, and her boss, she told me, said to her overtly, you should probably go out of the company after a while. Elena indicated that only women without children could reach the very top levels in their workplaces and in the country. So Elena took the government mandated five months of paid maternity leave, um, and this is paid out at 30% wage replacement. And, and Elena told me it was virtually unheard of for Italian fathers to take any leave time after having a child. And in 2013, Italy, uh, for the first time, implemented one day of mandatory paternity leave. <laughs> this day was paid out at 100% of wages, and they have since revolutionized this policy to now be four days of mandatory paid paternity leave. However, these paid leave days for men who are in relationships with women, you have to take the paid paternity leave days when a woman is also at home. God forbid a man be responsible for a child without a woman around, right? This sends a message about what the Italian government thinks men and women are good at and are capable of, right? Four days of mandatory leave, but at 100% of wages, women at five months at 30% of wages. Prior to this, no, mater no paternity leave whatsoever was available. And Elena told me she felt fine returning to work um, after her leave was up when Anna's grandparents could care for her, which was a central solution to Italian society. Um, but then the grandparents passed away and she had to find a different solution to help care for Anna when she went to work. Um, she reported telling, she, she reported to me feeling acutely guilty that she had to enroll Anna in a public daycare facility when she was three years old. This even though Italian daycares are, are renowned for being very high quality. Um, it still made her feel really guilty that she wasn't at, at home with family. And because these grandparents had passed away, this, this lack of help from the grandparents felt like an acute hardship for her. She told me that she didn't feel like a good mother because she worked too much outside the home. She said, of course, we have a lot of crises due to the fact that I cannot be here all the hours that I should stay with Anna. All her friends at the childcare, all the other mothers have a lot more time to stay together and to organize all the stuff. So I am, let's say, very excluded. And of course, here, pay attention to her language, this use of I, I cannot be here. She has a husband, but she's not referring to him. It's her job to take care of her child, right? Elena told me she felt like she was failing her daughter. She also told me she had few colleagues she could confide in. The truth is that there are not many other women in my position. 
And on her fingers, she counted for me three other women in her office that had kids. One of them had recently quit to be a full-time stay-at-home mom. Um, and the only other ones were these two other moms that she only saw occasionally in the office. And she said regretfully, so it's quite a rare case, mine. And at this point, she started crying during our, our interview in her daughter's bedroom. She told me that motherhood and work seemed incompatible, and her family couldn't afford for her to quit, like her colleague. She out-earned her partner, Francesco, and uh, they decided against having a second child because they couldn't figure out how to make it work. Um, this brought Elena a great deal of sadness, and the, this was a time in the interview we had to pause um, because she was crying too hard to continue talking when saying that her daughter would be an only child because they couldn't figure out how to make caregiving and employment work for their family so they would be a one-child one household. Elena's work-family conflict isn't surprising when we zoom out to look at the work-family policies available in Italy. As a familialist welfare regime, it, it's quite a family-oriented society, but it has a weak welfare state with a fragmented social protection system. Healthcare is universally available, and there are some benefits to families, but again, the state doesn't intervene in a heavy way, generally speaking, in the private sphere. And the dominance of the traditional breadwinner model, also the heavy Catholic influence and intergenerational support there means that women are generally expected to stay home and care for kids while men work outside the home. So in order to reduce this burden in her own household, Elena employed a solution that lots of women in Italy tend to use. She hired a full-time housekeeper and nanny named Oksana. And Oksana was a single mother from the Ukraine. And a later point in our interview, Elena confided to me that Oksana actually had difficulty securing care for her own child in order for her to care for Elena's. While hiring Oksana eased Elena's stress, she still felt really angry at the Italian government for not providing better supports for families like hers. She told me with a great deal of anger in her voice, as did all Italian moms, we get nothing, zero, no help from the government, and we pay so much in taxes which was interesting to hear her repeat frustration about this because her daughter was born in a public hospital, she took five months of paid per maternity leave, and she enrolled her daughter in a public daycare facility when she was three. But she still insisted the government did nothing whatsoever to help her. She also confided that her husband didn't do a whole lot around the house either. Elena admitted that he was an involved dad, but he didn't really help around the house. Uh, she referred to him as mamoni, a mother's boy, a mama's boy, right? Um, uh, for me, it's more the role of the mother. She, she kind of justified, I need to put on your clean dresses. I need you to have a bath to take you to the doctor. Um, <laughs> so she, she had experienced this arrangement growing up in her own extended household. Um, she told me that her mom was around all the time when she was little. My mother paid a lot of attention to our daily needs. She was really a present mom. She dedicated all her life to us. It's hard for me because I have this big example. I'm really not in the position to replicate this model. And this is another time in our interview where Elena broke down in tears, again, describing that she felt she was failing her daughter. I want us to take one more trip back across the Atlantic and into our nation's capital to, uh, to introduce you to a woman named Samantha in DC. And Samantha is a lawyer, and she and her husband, John, have a five-year-old and a 10-month-old. And we spoke in a windowless conference room in her office building uh, where employees walked around speaking in very hushed voices. And she, she made sure to close the door behind her all the way before we began our conversation. Samantha told me that she was panicked when she first found out she was pregnant. I worked very hard to ensure that nothing was different as a result of being pregnant and that I was taking on the same workload, sometimes more, trying to prove that I was as available, as accessible, and as committed. She said her firm, the, the lesson she learned from her firm is that you could have children, but the general expectation was if you made that choice, you needed to have a plan for someone else to care for them. And fully committed meant you were available at all hours whenever anything was needed. There weren't boundaries, she said. This ironically was a firm that I joined because they build themselves as a lifestyle firm, as a firm that was supportive of families. And she, she told me that they had handed her a pamphlet on their very supportive work family policies that had a picture of a parent coaching T-ball for their kids on the cover of it. But it became clear to her when she started this job, um, again, that she could only have kids so long as they didn't detract from her abilities at work. And I, I asked her, where did this message come from? And she laughed and said, from the people who say that moms are less capable. The message was perceived loud and clear, is what she told me. Um, she also really worried about having a second child and said, looking back at the young go-getter female associates who had been in our office, most had survived having one child. 
and those who went on to have a second child for one reason or another usually weren't at the firm six months later. Again, pay attention to her diction. They had survived <laughs> having a child, right? Um, to me, I found this language really powerful, and she, she shared her fears with a trusted mentor who didn't have any children, and this mentor laughed and said to her, I'm not sure our boss would still be supporting me if I chose to get a second dog. <sighs> so the U.S.'s emphasis on the primacy of the market means that adults are encouraged to work and to find private solutions to child rearing and to housework. The U.S., this again will not be a surprise to the folks in this room, but the U.S. has no national work family policy to support caregiving. We have no universal health care, no universal social insurance entitlement, no guaranteed vacation or sick days, no universal child care, no universal paid parental leave, and this has consequences in women's lives. Despite this, women like Samantha had a second child anyway. She took roughly four months off with each of her kids, cobbling together short-term disability leave with vacation days and sick days that she had hoarded or cobbled together um, for months ahead of time. Um, her husband took two weeks off unpaid with each of their children before returning to work full-time. And Samantha had had a C-section, and her boss asked her to start working from home nine weeks into her maternity leave. Recalling this in our conversation, Samantha grimaced and told me she was still quite literally knitting back together when she started taking conference calls from home while her son slept. And then when she went back to work after these four months, she returned to work full time. Samantha told me she described this as a disaster. And this was the point in our conversation uh, where Samantha burst into tears. And again, we paused. And Samantha reflected to me softly. Before I had children, the message I received was, I am woman, hear me roar. You can do everything. You can be at the top if you put your mind to it. You are awesome. Load of crap. I am awesome. I can't do everything. If I keep all the balls in the air, I'm broken. What's going to fail is my health. She described having acute migraines that kept her out of, out of work um, for days on end. She said, I've talked to so many friends in a similar position, and we can't figure out how to do it all at the same time. Samantha sobbed in the conference room at her work, and with tears streaming down her cheeks, she described to me feeling like a terrible mother. She felt that her taxing work hours and her absence from her kids were harming them. She knew that something had to change, so she described to me three strategies that she adopted uh, to change things and make them feel a little less crazy around their house. The first was that Samantha transferred to uh, a different position with fewer hours at a less prestigious firm, um, but she described this to me as a personal choice. She said, I went to the trouble to have a child, so I wanted to see my child. Second, she snapped her fingers and described learning to be hyper-efficient at work. Um, she told me that she got more done in a day than two of her colleagues typically did. And third, she bought a product called the Free Me. Does this resonate with anyone? Has anyone heard of this product? Okay. So the Free Me is uh, a product that some women opt to buy and bring into the workplace, which is what Samantha did. She was very proud of this solution. It's a hands-free breast pump. She ordered off Amazon Prime at the recommendation of her sister, who is an ER doctor, so that she didn't waste time walking to and from her firm's lactation room um, each day, which was a 12-minute walk, both directions, and she was pumping three times a day. The free me, she could hook up to herself under a poncho in her cubicle in order to pump breast milk and then go home without wasting 90 minutes walking each day. Samantha coped, she told me, by being a good mother instead of a great mother. She called herself a juggling mom. She told me, give yourself grace that you're not great at all of the things at all of the times. As long as nobody died and you didn't get <laughs> fired, it's okay. It will pass. To me, this is evidence of the very low expectations of American mothers. Not once did Samantha mention a governmental solution to her difficulties. She, like other U.S. mothers, looked at me somewhat blankly when I asked them if the government could perhaps help support them better. One woman summarized this view well when I asked her that, and she looked at me and said, yeah, but that would be like turning around the Titanic. <laughs> so I want to wrap up today um, by just highlighting a couple of contributions of the book and, and making motherhood work. The goal here is to show that what working mothers both want and expect when it comes to their work and family lives is deeply dependent on their social context. Social policies alone do not account for all the difficulties working mothers face. 
the larger context, including beliefs about gender equality and employment and motherhood, are also all critical factors for both understanding and ameliorating the difficulties that mothers face. And when mothers find that their expectations for work and motherhood aren't met, they also tend to blame different sources depending on where they live. They also tend to employ different solutions depending on uh, the context in which they live to ameliorate this stress. So the question I'm often asked after these um, presentations is, okay, so where do middle class working moms have it best? And the most satisfied moms are clearly in Sweden. Moms were most satisfied when they had extensive work family policy supports and attitudes uh, culturally supported the combination of employment and caregiving for both men and for women. So then the question is, okay, can we import Swedish policies to the US to make things better here? This book shows that these policies are part of a larger cultural discourse about work and parenting and gender equality. Swedish policies work in the context that uh, societal beliefs there highlight the reality that child, bearing, child rearing is a collective responsibility, right? Um, and that both men and women can and should work for pay while also caring for their families. Um, these are some examples from a photo project I did in Stockholm where I walked around and asked strangers if I could take pictures of them with their babies. Um, to me, this, uh, this, this set of cultural beliefs is incompatible with the neoliberal ideology ascendant in the United States today. In other words, work family po policies, I think, are symptomatic uh, of larger ethical and cultural understandings of what is and is not appropriate for women and mothers. And as such, I argue that they play a role in reproducing the existing social order. So this study tries to drive home the point that mother's stress is not of their own making and it cannot be of their own fixing. When we listen to the very real experiences of mothers, um, what we hear is that work family conflict is a phenomenon that societies have created, which also means that societies can change it, right? There is some hope. Sociologists usually throw it in right at the end. Um, the US can enact policies to remedy these very unequal social conditions that perpetuate mother's work family conflict and their disproportionate responsibility for caregiving. If women feel that their struggles are inevitable, very little political will exists to, to mobilize, to challenge oppressive social conditions. It's therefore vital that US women, in my mind, expand their understandings of the alternatives that are available to them as mothers, as partners, as workers, and as citizens. This book, I hope, provides a resource to do so. We need to imagine the collective emancipatory possibilities available through transforming our system of welfare provisioning. I argue in the book that what we need is collective action. We need a social movement for what I'm calling work family justice. Mother's difficulties working and raising kids are part of a broader politics or a power struggle. This book brings to life cross-national trends like fertility and labor force participation for mothers to show that they are very deeply political in nature. If mother's difficulties are political in origin, then surely part of the solution needs to be political as well. Thank you very much for your time.